All right. It is a privilege to be with you this evening. Uh, I got here before my suitcase did with my proper clothing and a way to get rid of whiskers. I was really worried that would make it, but we did by God's grace. I'm here, my clothes are here, and you're here. But most importantly, let's pray to ensure that the Lord Jesus Christ is ministering to us because I got nothing for you if that's not the case. So let's pray. Sweet Jesus, thank you for this privilege to know you, to worship together, and I pray that you would speak to us now as we're studying your word and as we're laying a framework of seeing your love through the principles of the sanctuary. Speak to us, O oh God, we pray, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, this evening's message, um, I sent a title, but I don't see it anywhere, so I don't have to claim it, and I didn't have time to change my slides. So uh, we'll call it God's Love Forgives. I want to address uh, an important principle here that the New Testament, with one minor exception, uses two primary words for forgiveness. And we're going to lay a framework here that will eventually apply to uh, the sanctuary service that we'll see here later. Um, could just be the adapter. But if it's easier for you to just switch this cable, we can do that. And then I'll just use this, and I can have my slides here. There we go. All right. So the New Testament, with uh, two primary, or one minor exception, uses two primary words for forgiveness. The first is haritzamai, and the second is afiamai. Haritzamai and afiamai. By the way, I'm happy to give you my slides if that's helpful. If you're not trying to take notes too quickly, or you're trying to take pictures, you can just have them if you want them. Just come talk to me after the fact. I'd be happy to share them. Um, so we'll look at the first one, Haritzamai. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 13, it says, And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven, Haritzamai, you all trespasses. Now, I'm not going to geek out on original languages this whole weekend, but it's an important principle I want to flesh out here. So here's one definition of Haritzamai. The most common meaning peculiar to the New Testament is to pardon or to graciously remit a person's sin. Uh, there's another definition used in the Greeks, uh, the Strong's Greek Dictionary. It says this, Haritzamai as a verb means to bestow a favor how? Unconditionally, whether divine or human. So what's implied here then is unconditional favor or pardon. It's God's posture of goodness, of forgiveness towards humanity. That's what's being implied here. The posture that God has towards humanity. Jesus takes the condemnation that you and I deserve, and he willingly pardons us. Amen? And this idea of God having a posture of forgiveness in the way in which he does life towards humanity is seen in a bunch of examples in Scripture here. And I'm going to flesh out some things. Some things may sound a little bit confusing initially. Just bear with me. It's all going to make perfect sense as I connect all these things together. But there are many examples of God doing this, portraying a posture of forgiveness towards humanity, even before we recognize where we are or what we've done. And this is super important, God covering Adam and Eve when they're in a situation that they are not owning, right? Adam's blaming Eve, Eve is blaming the serpent. We see Moses interceding for the nation of Israel all throughout, you know, Exodus and Numbers. And it's kind of a tricky scenario, right? Like God's saying, you know, these people clearly have been obstinate. Moses, I'm going to make a people out of you. And what does Moses say? He says, you can't do that. He says, God, forgive them. And does God listen to Moses? Yes or no? Yes. Are the people asking for that, though? No. But it implies that God was willing and does have a posture of forgiveness towards them. We see Jesus in Matthew chapter 9, there's a paralytic that's brought to him, and Jesus tells the man, son, your sins are forgiven you. And then he heals him of his paralysis. But was the man asking for forgiveness of his sins? No, but Jesus is showing the posture he has towards humanity, right? And the man lives a life that honors that goodness that he was shown. Jesus, when he's crucified in Matthew 27, prays, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Now, are the people that Jesus is praying for in that moment asking for forgiveness? But is God, through Christ, reconciling the world to himself with a posture of forgiveness, yes or no? Absolutely yes, right? We see Jesus forgiving Peter in John chapter 21 when he hasn't fully understood all of what's transpired. Stephen even does this. Stephen is a type of Christ, if you weren't aware of this. Um, at the end of the 70-week prophecy, Stephen is stoned before the gospel goes to the Gentiles, but it's very interesting that the trial and execution of Jesus is repeated. Now, Stephen doesn't die in the same way, but there's a false trial, 
false accusations. He's killed, and as he's being killed, he asks that God would forgive the people who were killing him, that God would show them mercy. Now, are they asking for that? No, they're gnashing their teeth and plugging their ears when he says, I see Jesus in heaven at the right hand of the Father and of the throne. We see in 2 Corinthians 5, 19, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses against them, having a posture of mercy towards humanity. And we're told in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. In fact, it begins by saying that God showed his own love for us. Some of us wrestle with unhealthy pictures of the Father. We can kind of roll with Jesus because he died for humanity, but the Father's a mystery to us sometimes, especially if we've had bad father figures in our lives, right? It's an unfortunate truth that our view of God is based largely upon our experience with our parents. And if people fail us, if we have an absentee father, it's difficult to relate to the paternal love of God. We can roll with Jesus. We see what he did. And so some of us kind of had this unintentional, maybe not an overt view, that Jesus kind of had to come to convince the father to love us. But Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 says that God showed his own love for us and that while we were still sinners, he sent Jesus to die for us. So Jesus didn't come to convince the Father to love you. It's because the Father already loved you that he sent Jesus, and that's before you got anything right, the Bible says. So it's not your performance, right, or even your understanding of your condition that awakens the forgiveness of God. That's the point. God has a posture of forgiveness towards you, period. It's not that if you do something, then I will have a posture of forgiveness. God has this posture period, because he longs to be reunited with humanity. The whole purpose of the sanctuary service was let them build me a sanctuary. Why? That I may dwell among them. He wants to be with us. So he's not looking for reasons to exclude us, and that's the point. God has a posture of being for you, not against you. Now, when this word is translated as, for, as forgiveness, haritzamai in the New Testament, apart from Colossians 2.13, it's always talking about interpersonal situations where someone is forgiving another individual without any mention of that person forgiving first or asking for forgiveness or confessing, which I think is very fascinating. So we forgive because we love, and it's impossible to love a sinner without forgiveness. And it's very interesting. Ella White makes this powerful statement in Manuscript Releases, volume 19, page 349. She says, Christ tells us that we must forgive the erring even 70 times 7. So she's making this point that we are called to forgive. Whether people recognize what they've done wrong or not, we need to forgive them. We must, we're told. Now, that is not saying that we need to put ourselves in situations where we can be harmed again or hurt or violated or in dangerous circumstances. Boundaries and forgiveness can move along side by side. That can happen. And in some ways, that's necessary. David did that with King Saul. He kept from a distance. He tried to reconcile. Saul tried to kill him again. He keeps at a distance, tries to reconcile. Saul tries to kill him again. So he says, I will someday die by the hand of Saul. It's better that I leave to the land of the Philistines. And the text literally says, once Saul hears that David goes to the Philistines, he pursues him no more. David had forgiven Saul. He saw reconciliation and boundaries were necessary in his relationship. And that may be the case for you. But that posture of forgiveness has to be there. That's the point. It's not justifying what they did. It's not appeasing or palliating sin. It's just the way that God does life. But she says this. So we're told to forgive 70 times 7, but how infinitely greater is the love of God than our love? So if God tells us to have a position of perpetual forgiveness towards others... Wouldn't it make sense that God would be the best at this? And not measuring off and saying, well, you know, I would, but you, you used up all the goodwill. Sorry. That's not the way that God deals with us. He has a posture of being for us, not against us. Now, that I give all this introduction to communicate the second phase. There are two phases of forgiveness. And this is found in the sanctuary. We're going to go there in just a second. There are, we as Seventh-day Adventists fully and unapologetically believe in a two-phased atonement. Okay, and this is laid out in the sanctuary service, in the daily services, in the yearly service. And we'll get to that here in just a moment. But it's that first phase of forgiveness that drives us to the second phase. So in Romans chapter 2 and verse 4, we're told that the goodness of God does what? It leads to repentance. That when we encounter the undeserved goodness of God, the unconditional pardon of God, when we encounter that, that's what leads us to repentance. 
So notice it's not that I need to repent before God will have posture of forgiveness towards me. He already has that. And when I encounter that undeserved goodness, that's actually what leads to genuine biblical soul-crushing repentance. Because you know God is giving you something that you don't deserve. And it does something to you, doesn't it? A great example of this is in Luke chapter 5. Jesus gets in Peter's boat after he has his presentation and he preaches to the crowd. He tells Peter, hey, throw your net on the other side of the boat. And Peter's like, look, bro, like I've been fishing all night. I do this for a living. That's cute. You do carpentry and stuff. But I do this for a living, and I fished all night and caught nothing. But because of your word, I'll do it. And what happens? Jackpot. Right? They fill two boats full of fish. The boats begin to sink because it's such a miraculous provision, undeserved goodness of God. And what's Peter's response? Depart from me, O Lord, for I am a sinful man. When Peter encountered the undeserved goodness of God, that's what led him to repentance. Notice it wasn't that when Peter repented, he was shown the goodness of God. It's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. Now, some of us may be thinking, yeah, but doesn't 1 John 1, 9 say that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness? Well, the interesting thing is the original language doesn't read that way. So the second word we talked about, there are two words for forgiveness. The first is haritzamai, unconditional pardon, but the second is afiamai. And afiamai means to send forth from or to send away from. And what it's implying is a separation between two parties. So literally, this is the way 1 John 1, 9 would read in the original language. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to separate us from our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God is not just interested in forgiving you of your sins, and I praise God and say hallelujah for that. He's not just interested in that, though. He doesn't just want to forgive you or have a posture of forgiveness towards you. He also is fully desirous to separate us from our sins. Amen? The two principles of forgiveness, two types of forgiveness mentioned in the New Testament. One speaks of pardon, the other speaks of cleansing and separating from sin. And this is exactly the way it's laid out in the sanctuary service in the Old Testament. One, giving the daily services, providing uh, pardon, and the second service, the yearly service, providing a separation of the sinner from the sin while cleansing the tabernacle in the camp, right? On the Day of Atonement, we'll allude to this more tomorrow uh, when we talk about the cleansing of the sanctuary, but on the Day of Atonement, all record of confessed sin that had been piling up in the sanctuary over the course of the year was completely removed and eradicated from the camp, and that's a means of celebration. Amen? It's so unfortunate that many of our own people are horrified of the topic of the investigative judgment, horrified of the idea of this teaching of, you know, that God is investigating the books and so forth, and what if I'm not good enough? Well, we'll, get, we'll deal with that here in just a moment, but what's super important to realize is a Jew, as soon as the Day of Atonement had finished, those services had finished, they threw a massive party and festival of celebration. Why? Because God had fully dealt with the sin problem. He had removed all record of sin. God was clearly fighting for them. That was a means of celebration, not abject horror and terror. Now, it was a solemn assembly. One was searching their heart, yes. But when that service was completed, there was tremendous celebration. And this is a beautiful thing. The morning and evening services, the morning and evening offerings, took place daily. And this happened without any confession from the people. The morning and evening services was God working for the people in the sins that they didn't even know they had committed. That was the purpose of those services. And those services even happened on the Day of Atonement. And this is amazing when you think about it. Imagine being an Israelite, and you look across the camp towards the tabernacle in the morning, and you see that waft of smoke going up from the altar. The immediate thought to a Hebrew Israelite at that stage would be, God's working for me. Even in the things that I don't know are wrong in my life, God's working for me even now. And I think this is so important for us, that God is looking for reasons to get you in the kingdom, guys, not looking for reasons to keep you out. There's a reason there's 12 gates on the New Jerusalem. Ease of access, beloved. God wants you in there. And the whole point of the sanctuary service was to remove the separation 
to get rid of what was separating us from God and to draw us to himself. This is what God wanted to do and what he's seeking to, to do for us. But a huge disclaimer here. We are not saying, when we address this idea of God having a posture of forgiveness towards you before you even ask, we are not saying this to discourage confession and repentance. In fact, it should lead to the opposite. When you encounter this undeserved goodness of God, again, it should lead one to repentance. And if you want to be separated from your sin, it will require confession and repentance. So we're not downplaying it, but we're putting things in their proper order, which I think is very important. So again, they're reminded morning and evening that God is working for them and not against them. And this would drive them even closer to Him and lead them to forsake anything that would pull them away from Him. If He's working for me this diligently, I don't want anything in my life that would hinder His work in my life. It's got to go. No matter how attached I am, how excited I am, how attractive I am to that thing, it's not worth it because God is doing things for me that my sins have never done for me. God is doing things for me that the enemy has never done for me. He's only used me like a plow horse and given me nothing in response. It ain't worth it. So what the Bible's making abundantly clear then is that the process of salvation begins with God and not you. And it puts things in their proper place. It's not that I put in the tokens of repentance and confession, and then maybe the machine will move and God will do something for me. Right? That's not how this works. God is working for you. God is the one initiating the plan of salvation, not you. That's why he came to do what he did. He takes the first step in pursuing and redeeming us, and this is what leads to our response of confession and forsaking of sin. But you have to have both of these views of salvation to have a balanced view. The two ditches in our church, and by the way, neither ditch is really getting it right. I said it. There should be no ditches in Adventism. We should be Bible-believing, Christ-following Christians, period. Don't sell your soul to this camp or that camp. I don't have a camp, and life gets better that way because you can think for yourself. And you can weigh out, whoa, 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 but what does, what does this guy think? Because if he thinks that, then maybe I should believe it too. No, 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 no. What does this say? and follow it unashamedly, fully, and completely, not worrying what the brethren may think about you. Follow the Word of God, beloved. You cannot err in doing so. But you have to have a balanced view of salvation. So one of our camps is focusing on this separating from sin side. Got to get sin out of your life. The other camp is focusing on it doesn't really matter. God loves you anyway. And taking one of those positions does not lead to a balanced view of salvation. Are you understanding? So, if we just focus on a FMI, separation from sin, it leads to legalism and a lack of assurance or belief that God wants us or will accept us. But if we just focus on haritzamai, the unconditional pardon of God, it will lead us to believe that we don't need to do anything or play a role in the process. We need to cherish both sides of this, both principles of forgiveness. And here's the point. The sacrifice of Jesus was so powerful and all-encompassing that no soul has been left unaffected. And listen to what the Bible says about this. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2. And Jesus is the propitiation, the covering for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for who? The sins of the whole world. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. How many have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God? All. And in the Greek, it's in the continuative. All have sinned and continue to fall short of the glory of God. We need a Savior. We can't get anything right. But the good news is that same all that sins and falls short of the glory of God is being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That Jesus is doing a work for us. And we'll see this really clearly here in a few moments. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 and 8. For when we were still without strength, when we brought nothing to the table, in due time Christ died for who? the ungodly. But God demonstrates his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How about 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10? For to this end, we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who's the Savior of how many? Of all men. But then it says, especially of those who believe. Now, this is speaking of those who will respond to the second phase of forgiveness, who will confess and forsake. Are you understanding? God has that posture of forgiveness towards all men, but those, especially those, right, who are confessing and forsaking. 
they're experiencing the even greater graces because they're experiencing both aspects of the plan of salvation. And we'll get to what the first achieved here in just a moment. Listen to this. Review and Herald, June 3, 1890. It is difficult for the reason to grasp the majesty of Christ, the mystery of redemption. The shameful cross has been upraised. The nails have been driven through his hands, his feet. The cruel spear has pierced to his heart. And the redemption price has been paid for how many? The whole human race. Ellen White says this in Signs of the Times. The whole world was gathered in the embrace of Christ. He died on the cross to give the death stroke to Satan and to take away the sin of every believing soul. That's the separating part, right? He calls upon us to offer ourselves on the altar of, sac of service a living, consuming sacrifice. We are to make an unreserved surrender to God of all that we have and all that we are. And what would lead somebody to do that is by knowing that God's working for them and that he's for them and not against them. That's what leads us to go all in without turning back. But here's how this falls into play. Romans 5 and verse 18. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to how many? All men. And what did it result in? Justification of life. This is an amazing teaching, this principle of justification of life. These topics of justification of life, or this topic, shows us the beauty of the gospel of Christ's death and resurrection and its impact upon our whole world. What's basically being stated here is that even the wicked right now are deriving the benefits of the justifying power of Jesus Christ. How is that? The very fact that you have breath in your lungs in this very moment is evidence that God is not holding your sins against you. You're not alive by happenstance. You are reaping the consequences of Christ's power. Now, this is not saying that everyone is saved right now, but what it is saying is everyone is spared right now. Their current existence in life right now is being justified because of the death of Jesus. Why? So they can have a time of probation to respond to the faith of Jesus by receiving justification by faith. There's justification of life and justification by faith. Okay? So listen to what Ellen White says about this. She hits a home run, bro. Listen to this. To the death of Christ, we owe even this earthly life. The bread we eat is the purchase of his broken body. The water we drink is bought by his spilled blood. And never one, saint or sinner, eats his daily food, but he is nourished by the blood and the body of Christ. The cross of Calvary is stamped on every loaf and is reflected in every water spring. Every benefit that you're receiving that sustains your life is only because of the goodness of Jesus. The neighbors you have in your neighborhood who could give two rips about Jesus are currently not enduring the wrath of God that they deserve. They are currently breathing borrowed life in their lungs because of the cross of Jesus Christ. Education, page 29. Christ is the light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. John 1, 9. And listen to this. As through Christ, how many human beings have life? Every one of them. So also through him, every soul receives some ray of divine light. Not only intellectual, but spiritual power, a perception of right, a desire for goodness exists in every heart. Even the secular atheistic celebrities who have philanthropic ambitions and humanistic views, those desires for the goodness of humanity do not come from atheism. They do not come from their own intrinsic moral compass. There isn't one apart from Jesus Christ. Every one of those noble principles is borrowed even though it's unappreciated from its source. And this changes our entire worldview when we recognize what Jesus is doing even for the wicked right now because he treats the wicked far better than you and I do. He's given them life. What are we doing? Ignoring them while they die. Jesus praying for the salvation of the world. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. This is what Ellen White says about it. Desire of Ages 745. That prayer of Christ for his enemies embraced the world. It took in every sinner that had lived or should live from the beginning of the world to the end of time upon all rests the guilt of crucifying the Son of God and to all forgiveness is freely offered. Haritzamai. Whosoever will may have peace with God and inherit eternal life. Amen? 
But here's the point, guys. This payment has already been paid in full, and Jesus can't go back and undie for you because you don't appreciate it. He can't. The only option Jesus had was to die a death that could and would justify the existence of all and could potentially save all by faith. Are you understanding? When you ask that Jesus would give you victory, what, you don't, what we many times don't realize is Jesus already lived a victorious life for you. He's not going to be resurrected and live another righteous life because now you accepted it and now your neighbor, oh man, I'm going to be resurrected again for your neighbor. And, oh, that's not how this works. Jesus came once and he settled the whole deal and paid the whole bill while he was here. And what he's doing in heaven right now is seeking to attribute that to your life in the here and now. And we're going to talk about that tomorrow. So, He's left the choice with us. We can reject it and refuse to surrender to it, but he can't undo what he's already done. He had to do what was necessary for all, and he did it. Now, to be very clear, we are not saying that no one will be lost. Never said it, wouldn't say it, don't assume I'm saying it. Scripture is clear, though, that many, unfortunately, will be. What we are saying is that the cross of Christ and the love of God are so powerful that none should be lost. His sacrifice was so sufficient as to encompass all of humanity. And we don't seem to appreciate this. Our neighbors, our family members are currently receiving the goodness of God, whether they appreciate it or not. God's working for them. Are you? Am I? And it even justifies the current existence of the lost along with the saved to give them a probationary time to respond to the faith of Jesus. And it makes perfect sense, really, right? No one could respond to the cross and be justified by faith unless they first receive the justification of life. Dead people can't accept the gospel, right? It just makes sense. We are not currently enduring the condemnation we deserve because of the grace of Christ. And the big variable in the equation is our response to this grand display of the love and pardon of God. Will we accept the gospel or will we continue to reject God's pleading through His Spirit to bring us home? And I love this because Paul encapsulates all of this in 2 Corinthians 5, beginning of verse 14. For the love of Christ compels us. It's the love of Jesus Christ that fuels and motivates the Christian. Not the external pressures and fear of violating the law of God, of going to hell, or the the longing just to go to heaven. In fact, we were told that the longing for heaven and the longing to avoid hell is a selfish motivation and never works. So what should be our motivation? Love. Only by love, though, is love awakened. And no one is going to find love in their hearts for Jesus until they first encounter the love of Jesus. We love him, 1 John 4, 19, or 18, I think. We love him because he first loved us, which is why he has to make the first move, which is why he has a posture of forgiveness towards you, whether you respond or not, because he understands this principle that only by love is love awakened. So it's the love of Christ that compels us, that fuels us, especially even with our our interpersonal relationships. It should be the love of Jesus that drives us. Because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. He died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves. Did you know that? Jesus literally died for us so that we would stop living for ourselves. But for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. And I love this. We are so good at treating people like commodities. We view them based upon what we can get out of them. But the gospel changes that, especially understanding this whole justification of life thing. It changes everything. We don't view men according to the flesh based upon what we can get out of them. We recognize these people are living on borrowed time. And these are people who are filled with potential for the goodness of God and for the glory of God and for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We don't view them the way we used to. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, I love this, yet now we know him thus no longer. Very few of us come to Jesus for unselfish reasons. A splitting hangover, a divorce, a tragedy. We hit rock bottom. And what I love about this is Jesus doesn't really seem to care about that. Because we're told in John chapter 6 and verse 37 that he who comes unto me, I will in no wise cast out. 
He doesn't say, he who comes to me with pure motives, I'll accept. All he's asking is for you to come. And if you come, that's enough. You know what Ellen White says on that, by the way? She says, if this is the only promise we have to offer God, if all you have to offer God is this one promise from your Lord and Savior, that he who comes unto me, I will no wise cast off, she says, you will never, never be turned away. And then she goes on to say, cling to this promise and you are safe. And then she says, if this is all you have to offer God in that very moment when you claim that promise of John 6, 37, he who comes unto me, I'll in no wise be cast out. In that moment, she says, you are as safe as though inside of the city of God. God is pursuing the lost. God wants the lost in the kingdom. He's not looking for reasons to keep you out, guys. He's looking for every good and reasonable reason to get you in that city. But will you come? That's the question. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. And he's given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself not imputing, not crediting their trespasses to them. That's why they're still alive, right? And it's committed to us the word of reconciliation. Our call as mission-minded Christians is to be agents and ambassadors of reconciliation. And it's not that God had to be convinced to be reconciled with humanity. God has always had a posture of reconciliation towards humanity. That's the point of this message. It's us that's the problem. God is seeking to speak into our thick skulls and help us understand, I have never been against you. There's not been a single day in your life where I've been against you. So where is this hostility? Where is this indifference coming from? This is not coming from me, he says. Now that we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. That text is amazing. Everything that you have been, Jesus became. Why? So that you can become everything that he has been in God's eyes. We see this in the, in the woman who's caught in the act of adultery in John chapter 8, and we really should stop phrasing it this way because it places all the blame on her. It really should be the lady whom the fools amongst the Pharisees accused and set up to try to trap Jesus. The poor dear sister, right, who was roped into this situation to trap Jesus. And so anyway, in this situation, Jesus pardons her. He says, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she says, no one, Lord. He says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Neither do I condemn you, haritzamai, unconditional pardon, and go and sin no more. Be separated from your sins. Amen? Amen. We see that principle here. She encountered both pardon and cleansing. And Ellen White comments on this. She says this, and listen to the chronology. The woman had stood before Jesus, cowering with fear. His words, he that is without sin among you, let him cast a stone, had come to her as a death sentence. And of all the people in that gathering, who could have cast a stone at her? Jesus. Did he? Absolutely not. She dared not lift her eyes to the Savior's face, but silently awaited her doom. And in astonishment, she saw her accusers depart, speechless and confounded. And then those words of hope fell upon her ear, Neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. Her heart was melted. Casting herself at the feet of Jesus, she sobbed out her grateful love, and with bitter tears, what did she do? She confessed her sin. Was Jesus' posture of forgiveness towards her before or after she confessed? Before. And that's what led to her. The goodness of God led her to true, genuine repentance. This was the beginning of a new life, Ella White says, a life of purity and peace devoted to God. So what Jesus is telling her is to walk in the reality that he's already made available to her. And he's offering the same thing to you and I today. When instead of asking Jesus to give me freedom, I receive the freedom you've already achieved on my behalf. 
Instead of asking God to please forgive me, Lord Jesus, I recognize I have sinned, I have erred, and I'm sorry. I repent of that sin, and I receive your forgiveness. Not just hoping, will you forgive me, but receiving, because God is faithful to provide. Amen? Absolutely faithful to provide. So we're not saying repentance isn't part of the Christian's experience. It absolutely is. But you can come boldly into the presence of Jesus, because if you're coming for, for, for cleansing and separation, you better believe he's going to provide. Amen? So she could go and sin no more because she now understood and accepted the fact that she was not condemned. Listen to this. The book of Micah encapsulates this. We're almost done. Who is a God like you doing what? Pardoning iniquity, haritzimai, and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. Amen? God delights in mercy. He will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. That's a fiamai, separation from sin. You will give truth to Jacob and mercy to Abraham, which you sworn to our fathers from days of old. So here's the point, beloved. In the life, death, burial, resurrection, and intercessory ministry of Jesus Christ, complete pardon, complete cleansing, and complete separation from sin is fully accounted for. Nothing, no expense was spared for your redemption. And so choose to walk in the reality of the faith of Jesus today. As we're reflecting upon the sanctuary service this week and the goodness of God this weekend, keep this in mind. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 9 and we'll close with this idea. Matthew chapter 9, verses 28 and 29. Eh, verse 27. When Jesus departed from there, Matthew 9, verse 27, when Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying out and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus asked them a question. Do you believe I'm able to do this for you? Do you actually believe I'm able to do what you so desperately need in your life right now? Do you believe I'm able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, according to your faith, let it be to you. That's my appeal to us this evening. Do you actually believe that God is not only capable, but willing to forgive you? And do you believe that he's not only willing, but also capable to separate you from your sin? Do you believe that tonight? Do you believe I'm able to do this for you? Because according to your faith, let it be done unto you. We love him because he first loved us. We have faith in Him because He first had faith in us. And we forgive others as He first forgave us. And it reminds me of the story of Mary Magdalene, by the way. She didn't receive forgiveness because she loved. She loved because she was forgiven. First John chapter 4, verse 19, it is verse 19, that we love Him because He first loved us. Has this made sense this evening, yes or no? There's a God in heaven who's working for us, guys. He's worthy of our allegiance and loyalty and worship. And even the wicked, even the lost right now, are receiving the goodness of God for a purpose. Everyone in this world right now has breath in their lungs for a divine purpose, to respond to the goodness of God and receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? God, I thank you for loving us and for forgiving us fully. Lord, forgive us for not believing that we're forgiven. Forgive us for doubting that you really could and would think of us in this fashion. But I thank you that the gospel is true, that it is good news, and that you are fully fighting for your people even now. We pray that you would cover our sins with the blood of Jesus, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, and that you would give us a peaceful night's rest as we come back tomorrow to fellowship and learn more of you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.